Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for a webinar titled Lessons Learned from Teaching at the University of Nairobi during COVID-19. Um, I am recording now the, the webinar uh, so we, we can get started. Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Um, next slide, please. So before we get started, just a few quick housekeeping rules uh, to note. Uh, firstly, that the participant audio and video are disabled. Um, also that you're able to post questions using the Q&A function at any time. You'll see the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom, uh, Zoom screen. Um, otherwise, you can also post in the chat box, but if possible, in the Q&A box. Um, this session is being recorded, um, so yes, we will offer the recording and all PowerPoint presentations afterwards to all those who registered, but also we'll be posting it on our i &E website. And finally, we are also providing closed captioning in English, so if, if you don't automatically see it, you should be able to um, look for it as well here on the Zoom platform. Um, yeah, and I think we, we can get started now. Thanks very much. Um, yes, I'll hand it over now to Louise Juchuhi, who is a lecturer at the University of Nairobi and also the INE Country Focal Point for Kenya. Thanks, Louise. Uh, thank you so much, Natari, for uh, giving me the chance to uh, give my reflection. And my reflection is uh, titled The World Beyond COVID 19. I don't know whether we are beyond or we are still within. Um, but my question is Is higher education ready uh, for what may come uh, after or beyond the COVID 19? And I'm trying to set the agenda for the, the discussion that we would want to have today. Next slide, please. So as the reality of COVID-19 hits the world, uh, people thought it was a temporary global disturbance. And this changed two months, months to years. And more than 1.5 billion children from 195 countries were affected by school closures. And this, of course, it's data taken from UNESCO and World Bank, so we can get more on that. The healthy pandemic created secondary pandemics that might have a generational impact for years to come. Next slide. So the education sector was unexpectedly affected from early childhood uh, through to universities. Despite the disruption of the pandemic, education, educators have remained responsible for ensuring children achieved academically. So the context at which we need to reflect ourselves in is the different countries were, are affected differently. We know that uh, uh, some countries were able to bounce uh, quickly. Some were not able to bounce quickly. We have our East African country, one of them that just opened uh, the school doors in January this year after two years. So different countries suffered differently. And of course, they were, they were able to bounce back depending with the uh, vulnerability and preparedness. Um, some countries bounce back quicker than others. Of course, I've mentioned that. Some are still recovering from the shocks uh, because, uh, of course, the shocks were touching on various dimensions. It touched on the readiness of the teachers, readiness of teaching materials, readiness of the infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So it is important for us to reflect beyond where we are and beyond uh, what the country or the countries can do uh, beyond COVID-19. And more so because we are looking at university, the university education, how can it be prepared so that it can bounce back very quickly when we have a pandemic? Thank you. 
So the COVID-19 pandemic shows that uh, uh, there is need to raise the momentum uh, to rethink, to reimagine, re-innovate, recreate the education sector, uh, to prepare all institutions, to prepare human resources and infrastructure in order to respond to global shocks that have been shown to destabilize their day-to-day -day activities, mission, and vision. Next slide, please. So the University of Nairobi, the host of this webinar, is guided by the vision of being a world-class university committed to scholarly excellence by providing quality education and training to the global community. As we strategize on meeting the demands for our clientele, the university's transformative agenda will not only help us to understand our role, but will challenge us to rethink collaborative partnerships to address a common agenda of providing quality education for all now and beyond the COVID-19 period. Next slide, please. So my question is, is the education sector prepared to mitigate future crises? And is this a difficult question uh, from University of Nairobi lens? I would want to um, I would want to invite our vice chancellor, uh, Professor Julia Songengo, uh, to give us some remarks uh, on uh, the readiness of the University of Nairobi and how we were ready uh, to bounce back as early as 2020. Uh, thank you, Professor, for coming in. Welcome. This is your chance. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you are all interested in this matter uh, for very clear uh, reasons. We ask ourselves those critical questions that you have raised, whether the world was ready and whether the necessary arrangements were met. You can never be ready for an emergency. But what policies and strategies should we then have put in place to mitigate some of the impacts? Two years later, what critical lessons have the university learned and how can we use this information to prepare for any future eventualities? The University of Nairobi leverages more than 10 years of experience in education and emergencies. We continue to offer education and emergencies program at master's level to prepare our future teachers. In addition, the university has over the years built collaborations and partnerships that have put the university on the global map. Having said that, we note that the recent network where the university is a founding member, Africa University Network for Higher Education Emergencies, we are committed to providing expertise towards achieving the set goals. 2020 and 2021 was indeed a unique period for the University of Nairobi. As the university celebrated 50 years anniversary, one of the oldest leading university country and indeed the region, we have a rich history, traditions and a strong resolve to be a beacon of hope and faith for our staff, students, and by extension, all Kenyans. The pandemic tested this resolve in every way. For the first time in 50 years, for example, the university was closed, albeit only for a few, two weeks actually. We asked our staff and students to go home on 16th of March, and within two weeks, we were able to develop a strategy to remain fully operational through the available online platforms. And by April, we started to train faculty to teach online exclusively. And we have continued to support all staff and students to ensure continuity of all functions of the university. Ladies and gentlemen, and in the last two years, the university has transformed in many ways. 
We have shown our resilience and resolve to adapt to the changing times. And today, I'm here to share some of our achievements and successes. One, our researchers for various fields like medicine, chemistry, education, agriculture have been heavily involved in research and policy formulation on COVID-19. As many of you are aware, it's also during this pandemic that the university set out on a journey to reform, to revolutionize this university and take it to greater heights. And in the last eight months or so, we have reviewed the curricula for over 100 programs in order to address the changing needs and demand for training. As a university, we have adapted blended teaching and learning to ensure continuation of education. And this approach has, of course, brought out many challenges like access to internet, technology and quality of teaching as issues we continuously try to address through partnerships. We have held four graduation ceremonies in September and December of 2020 and also of 2021. And we have graduated over 15,000 students on schedule. We've also had many local and regional institutions of higher learning visit the university for benchmarking. And we continue to receive delegations from many universities to share lessons and learn from each other. We have held numerous virtual events on prayer day, open week, and webinars such as this one, mounted classes and examinations and virtual meetings and many other activities. Indeed, the entire academic and administrative process of the university, as well as governance, has transformed to virtual. These virtual experiences have taught us a valuable lesson. The lesson of adaptability and resilience. We have come to appreciate that e-learning is here to stay and that as a University of Nairobi community, our connection is still very strong even with the limited face-to-face -face interactions. Ladies and gentlemen, the University of Nairobi has a strong partnership culture. And this webinar has made possible through our collaboration with renowned institutions represented today. For example, the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies. And we are glad that uh, Lois Bichuhi is a focal point in this matter. We have done well in my assessment and we can only get better and stronger. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, for your insights um, that only enrich our understanding and especially to understand how University of Nairobi has come up uh, all the way from 2021, uh, uh, sorry, 20, uh, 2020, 2022, and uh, we are still uh, growing stronger. Uh, there are so many um, areas we, we have transformed. Of course, uh, for example, teaching has been going on, uh, breaded teaching. Uh, these are some of the things that uh, we, we have taken uh, maybe from the window of opportunity that COVID has presented to, to us. And I think as we continue learning lessons, there are so many lessons, uh, positive ones that uh, the university has picked uh, from the, the COVID-19 uh, window of opportunity. Uh, thank you so much. I would now want to bring uh, Dean uh, Brooks, the i and &E, um, director, uh, to give us some remarks. And I am hoping that uh, we can have some questions raised so that uh, our vice chancellor, acting vice chancellor, can continue staying with us so that we can answer some of the questions that can come from the audience. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you, Thank you Professor Louise, and appreciate all you do for education and emergencies. <clears throat> Thank you also, Vice Chancellor Julia Sogango for this uh, really insightful comments. Um, just to say um, how grateful I am that uh, we have this time to talk together. Um, I believe there's really a need to continue this global dialogue on the best way to mitigate the global pandemic. And especially when we talk about how it's affecting education globally um, and in higher education. So 
you know, really a chance to learn from you on how to prepare the teachers to teach before, during, and after a crisis. We want to continue to, to understand better how we can support teachers and really the role that the university can play in pre and post service in addressing COVID and after COVID. I really think uh, it's important to recognize University of Nairobi um, and their work. And it's, it's exciting to hear that you're now at 10 years. I didn't realize that 10 years uh, with a master's degree program in education and emergencies. And I remember visiting Louise years ago, I think back in one of the first or second years of the program uh, and meeting with the students. And it was so, so inspiring and exciting to hear that that work continues. The University of Nairobi really is a pioneer university um, that is offering education emergencies. One of, uh, you know, maybe it might even be the only one with a dedicated program, although we have programs globally, um, you know, there, there are programs and classes, but, he, you know, the University of Nairobi's got an amazing focus on education emergencies, and it's important to remember that. And we're so thankful to be keep, to keep working with Louise um, and her volunteer support to our country focal point role and happy that she's agreed to help us uh, again. And so thank you for championing education emergencies, Louise. Uh, so valued. You know, you're the one I keep calling up all the time when I need to, to have a representative or to talk about an issue related to higher education in emergencies. And the university is really in a central role. Um, especially note, note, um, noting that Nairobi is a major hub for international development and humanitarian organizations and agencies. Uh, so thank you, Vice Chancellor, for the role you continue to play in building the university, supporting these programs, supporting INEE. Uh, I hope uh, in someday in the near future, we get to meet in person and continue to build on our collaboration and partnership. Uh, so thank you. And I'll hand back to you, uh, Professor Luis. Um, but thank you for inviting me to join your webinar um, and to talk today. Uh, thank you so much, Dean. Um, we appreciate your presence. We appreciate your commitment into playing the, the league of education in emergencies. Uh, especially under the umbrella of interagency network for education in emergencies. It brings us all together uh, to, to talk and to discuss. And especially now that uh, we are trying to look at the minimum standards, it's uh, the best opportunity to talk and dialogue all of us together and to think how best the minimum standards could uh, really be applicable even in very deep places in our countries and especially uh, meeting uh, the marginals and uh, those affected by crisis. Uh, thank you so much. I would want to uh, bring to the attention of Natari, if there are any questions maybe. Natari, do we have any question? Yes, Louise, um, there's a question in the Q&A box. From Esther Wamungo, um, she is asking, I think from the acting vice chancellor, please bring to our attention the kind of digital tools that the university uses to deliver curriculum. So this question is, uh, is uh, addressed to our vice chancellor. So uh, uh, Esther, as I repeat, a good presentation from acting Vice Chancellor Kaidre. Um, so I bring to our attention the kind of uh, digital tools that the university uses to deliver curriculum. Our Vice Chancellor. E-class, Google Class, Microsoft Teams, um, WebEx at some point, Zoom. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Uh, you have talked about uh, different platforms that uh, the teachers have continued to use. And I think we have varieties, as you have mentioned, that makes our class uh, library and also um, we are able to reach each and every student. Um, we have another, I don't think we have any other question. Any other question? Uh, maybe anybody would want to ask a question. Yes, if anyone wants to raise their hand, they can also do that. Um, raise their virtual hand and we can allow you to speak. Or, or you can post a question in the chat. There's no schedule for... There's a question that uh, I think has been addressed to us. They don't, Would there be a need have? for some sort of special education on the tools to the students? Maybe those there students be. Uh, with yeah. disabilities. Vice yes. Chancellor, do you want to answer that question? On the need for those with special needs. Vice, Vice Chancellor, you're on mute. Sorry, just need to unmute. Vice Chancellor, the yes, question sorry, is, sorry, uh, I, I lost. What was the question again? Sorry. Uh, would there be a need for some sort of special education on the tools to the students? Special education on the tools to the students? I think uh, um, yes, the person the, is asking. The, sorry? There is always need for special training. So what the university has done is uh, continually refresh the training on the use of these uh, platforms. When the students come for the first time, they go through two weeks of training. And then uh, every time we, we adjust one or two things, we take them through another session of training until they are all able to use uh, our platforms uh, sufficiently well. So the need is uh, continuous. It will change and they always ask and we are awake to it all the time. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for that. Maybe we can allow some people to raise their hearts if they are not using the QA quest box. Louise, there is a raised hand from Helen Aviza. So I'll, I'll let her talk. Yeah, Helen, if you want to ask your question, I'm letting you talk now. Go ahead, Helen. You can ask your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to Prof. to Dr. Lois and Professor Wanyama for the presentation. Uh, my question is on virtual or the online lessons. Were all uh, students reached during the COVID nineteen, and what happened to those who could have not have been reached? through virtual lesson, uh, did they go back or were they taught afresh or they just caught up with the rest? Because I know when COVID struck, nobody was prepared for it and schools and the universities closed uh, abruptly. So on provision of online lessons, were actually all students reached and if not all were reached, what was done to those who did not get uh, or who did not get involved in the lessons? Thank you very much. That for me also? Yes, yes. Okay. yes. No, yes. We um, First of all, we did uh, many things to increase the reach of uh, our students. Uh, the first was to support them with the data bundles um, and then expand our network connectivity in and around the university and uh, give them access through uh, virtual private network arrangements. 
how many were we able to reach? 75% were reached in that academic year. We were already in the second semester. We were able to reach about 75%. And so we got to graduate about 70% of those we anticipated to graduate. What did we do with the ones we couldn't reach? We allowed them a chance to take the sessions when they were able. And we realized that a lot of them were, could move from one place to another where there was network. And we were able to round a lot of them up so that by the second year, we had actually reached uh, close to 90%. The 10% whom we didn't reach rejoined in the following academic year. And we opened uh, the university somewhat so that those who are unable to join in from other places could come to campus, continue the online classes, but enjoying the connectivity within the university. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. I think, um, Helen, you are comfortable. I can see some uh, other answers. I think we share. Uh, still emphasizing what Professor have said. Yes, 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 let him come. Um, okay, I'm comfortable, Dr. Lois. Thank you very much for the response, Professor. Uh, thank you, thank you, Helen. I don't know whether there is any other question, uh, Natari, and uh, you can guide us on how we are doing on time. Thanks, Louise. Um, <clears throat> we still have a lot of time left, but um, yeah, colleagues, if they have any other questions they want to make, um, feel free to do it now. Um, posting in the Zoom chat Q&A box, or you can raise your hand again and you'll be allowed to speak. Um, there is a comment from Boniface Ngaruya. Sorry if I pronounced it wrong. <laughs> um, he wrote here earlier, the university supported students and staff with data bundles to attend classes and strengthen, strengthen library electronic information sources. So I guess that's a comment from Boniface. Yeah. Though it seems, I'm not sure if vice chancellor isn't in the meeting anymore, Louise. I don't know if his, maybe his connection went out. I think he has dropped, mm. he may have dropped. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, um, we can end it early as well. There's no problem um, unless, yeah, if anyone else has any additional questions. Maybe that Louise can answer, but yeah, up to you, Louise, to decide. <laughs> I have Louise. no problem. Uh, if there's any question we could answer, we could also have a, a dialogue with the members of the, uh, the panelists who have uh, come in, uh, especially Helen. Helen is coming from the Minister of Education. Uh, maybe she can just uh, give us some highlights of what the Minister of Education is doing uh, in terms of uh, uh, mitigating on COVID-19. Helen, mm -hmm. Apisa, maybe she can be given some few minutes. Mm -hmm. That would be great. And Louise, I had a follow-up question um, for you. I'm really curious about some of your former students in the master's program, and if you've heard from them since they left university and are now teaching or working in emergency settings. I wondered if you had any um, highlights from their learning um, as they're now implementing programs? Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dean, for that question. Uh, what we have done uh, over time is that uh, we keep ourselves together. Uh, we have okay. WhatsApp groups uh, that we, we, we keep on talking. Uh, and I think uh, a number of them are here. Um, they have joined the webinar. So we, we are together um, and we keep That's on true. talking. Uh, we keep on mm -hmm. sharing, uh, we keep on uh, uh, understanding what uh, we are doing. And I'll call upon Esther Wamungu just to say what she's doing with, um, uh, with uh, WhatsApp and uh, smartphones, and especially with yeah. the parents and her students. So Esther Wamungu, okay. I know she's in the, in, the, in the room, but we can start maybe uh, with Helen. 
Helen, if we yeah, and I would love to hear from Helen as well. I didn't realize she was at the Ministry of Education. That's so great. Yeah. Helen, are you with us? Helen, you're able to speak if you'd like. Uh, hello, everyone. I think you are confusing. Um, Helena Munga from the University of Nairobi, but you are looking for Helena Visa of the Minister of Education. Ah, oh, sorry. Yes, let me habilitate Helena Visa. Thanks, Helen. Okay. Lots of Helens on the top. <laughs> Uh, before Helen comes, uh, we still have Esther Wamungu, um, and she's asking what was the gender uptake of digital learning among runners, which gender is more responsive? Um, thank you for that question, um, Esther. Uh, I may not have the figures with me for now, uh, and since our uh, vice chancellor has dropped, uh, maybe it's a question that I would want to carry. And, uh, give you appropriate uh, answer when I have the facts. Thank you for asking that question. And maybe uh, when I'm still with Esther, she can just highlight some of the areas she's working on, including working with the smartphones and the parents. Esther. Louise, I think Helen Avisa is, is back on, is uh, available now, right, Natalie? Yes, Helen, you can speak. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, am I, has the other person completed? Can I speak now? Yes, please, Esther. Oh, sorry. This Helen. is Helen. Please go okay, ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Geshui. Uh, what I can say on what the Minister of Education is doing on mitigating the issues of uh, online uh, or virtual lessons in schools for, I'll talk about the, the early learning and basic education department, which covers the ECD primary and secondary and then the teacher training colleges. And uh, what I know most, uh, it was a very big challenge when COVID struck uh, because the ministry was not prepared. However, they are usually the edu channel uh, where children are taught uh, over the radio and also the TV. Uh, however, this was not very effective because uh, not all children could access these uh, gadgets like radios and TVs, especially in remote areas, in hard to reach areas, in the rural areas, and also in the urban slums. Very many children missed on these two. Children are at different levels in schools. And uh, when, they talk, when they listened or they accessed those gadgets, maybe to some, the lessons were far much ahead or far much behind, and not all children were at the same level. So it was still a challenge. However, uh, the, the, the channel, the communication channel actually reached some learners who kept at pace with it. And even up to now, the issue of uh, engaging virtual learning is still a challenge because for the basic, for early learning and basic education department, it's still a challenge because only children who are in private schools with very organized ways of uh, parents being able to support their children to access virtual learning where it is offered, then it works. But mostly for the public schools, it's still a very big challenge because most of them, some boarding is, uh, public high schools uh, where uh, parents can afford, their children can access the lessons on WhatsApp and whatever. But for 
the others who do not have smartphones, who do not access this uh, kind of learning, it's still a big challenge. And maybe with the help of our partners and also the ministry may be needing to streamline on this, we still have some way to go as a ministry. But on Edu Channel and uh, the radio lessons offered by KICD, those ones are still available to learners who cannot maybe make it to school or who need virtual learning, but still to only those who can access or who have access to those gadgets. So we still have a long way to streamline this area and ensure that in case of a pandemic uh, like this one of COVID-19, then we also need a lot of uh, collaboration with our partners and even with the parents so that uh, children can access virtual learning. But where we are right now, or as far as virtual learning is concerned, we still have a long way to ensure that it is streamlined and it can work for us and all the children from all the backgrounds can access virtual learning through the channels that will be offered from wherever they are. Because you know, in some areas, if it's radio, TV, the access is still very difficult. And also the smartphones, which not everybody can afford, it's also still an issue uh, at that level of education. So that's what I can say about the State Department for early learning and basic education. But uh, for the higher learning, I know universities are able to implement that. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Helen, for bringing the, the Ministry of Education Argo and uh, the, the lessons and uh, maybe best practices uh, amidst of uh, quite a number of challenges that are touching on regional imbalances and so on and so forth. Uh, thank you so much. We only wish ourselves the best and especially uh, in catching up with the children that were not able to uh, cope between uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, thank you so much. Um, before I call upon Esther, um, we have a, a question that uh, is asked, did you face any challenges from the lecturer's ability to embrace technology? And I would want to uh, call upon Susan and uh, uh, my colleague Susan and Ruben Motegi, just to help me clarify that question. My colleagues, uh, Susan and Ruben. Susan, you can start. Uh, Chair, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much for this opportunity. I would like to respond to that uh, question. Uh, as a lecturer, initially, uh, we had those challenges, you know, like when you are embracing a new technology. But upon being trained, uh, as I had written there, we were again retrained until we were able to use uh, e-class for, for, for teaching. Uh, we were also trained in the use of Google Meet and also Zoom for the large classes. So I may say that initially it was a challenge, but with the retraining and uh, encouragement we were able to use, we were able to, to reach out to our students who are far away from us. And uh, I think we've re uh, at this time, I can say that nearly uh, in the period or two years period, nearly now uh, every, every student or every lecturer is competent in the use of uh, the technologies that we were trained in. So I don't know whether I've answered. Uh, over to you, Dr. Mutegi. Dr. Mutegi, you should be able to speak now if you'd like to, um, just need to mute. Dr. Mutegi, are you around? Mm 
maybe before Dr. Motegi comes in, we can hear from Julius Gige, uh, who is working in Kakuma. Uh, Julius Gige is one of our, of our master students uh, who is just finalizing his project. Uh, Julius, maybe you can say, I've seen you have said COVID-19 pandemic to me was a widow of opportunity. Uh, maybe we would want to hear that uh, more from you, Julius. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lois. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, um, Julius. I work in Kakuma Refugee Camp. And uh, in the period of COVID-19, uh, it was a very, uh, to me, it was a, a learning experience because uh, I was doing my uh, postgraduate studies at uh, University of Nairobi uh, initially before the there was COVID and I used to travel to Kikuyu campus. And uh, from where I am to Trukana to Nairobi, it's quite a distance. And uh, out of this COVID-19, uh, we used, uh, through our lecturers, uh, we were introduced to various digital platforms to learn, uh, such as Google Meet, and uh, the sessions were quite interactive. I could uh, attend my classes at my comfort way in, here in Trukana. And I could interact with my lecturers. Uh, the sessions were interactive, and even the examinations were online. So to me, it was uh, an opportunity to learn, to embrace digital learning. And how I wish uh, that these things, even after the COVID nineteen ends, it's 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 not going to uh, uh, the learning is not going to uh, to stop at uh, resuming to the normal say, of just face-to-face, -to -face. but uh, our wish the institutions are going to en embrace e-learning such that even students who are quite far, I had my friends uh, from South Sudan, uh, I, I believe that it was convenient to them because they could not travel all the way to come to the physical classes. So to me, they did, uh, the COVID in as much as uh, the pandemic was, uh, it was real to me. It was a, a, an opportunity because I, I came to embrace indeed digital learning. I used to hear people uh, studying in America and the, without going to America, but I came to notice it's possible because I'm now finalizing my my research and uh, we've not met physically with my supervisors, but we've been communicating uh, through the digital platform. So. It was a learning experience. Over to you, Dr. Lois. Uh, thank you so much, Julius. And uh, uh, thank you for bringing that angle that uh, the university has uh, gone to our students. Instead of our students coming to us, the university has now gone to the students. And of course, uh, that is uh, cost effective either way. You have mentioned that uh, it has been easier and uh, efficient and cost effective for you not to travel to Nairobi. I was teaching a class uh, today in the morning and I was teaching two classes at the same time. Uh, that is Kikuyu campus and uh, Kenya science campus. Under normal circumstances, I would have traveled to Kikuyu campus one day. And then the following day, I would uh, maybe travel to Kenya science, but I was able to bring them together, uh, which is not only um, saving time, but it's also uh, saving uh, on maybe uh, the money that uh, many of the students, because they could log in from their homes, that they would need maybe to come to class. So I think, uh, as you have mentioned, it is a window of opportunity. We need to embrace, uh, we need to, uh, to have some lessons, and we need to document these lessons for the future. I want to, um, to hijack uh, someone called uh, Dr. Garuya and uh, maybe uh, Juliet, uh, Dr. Juliet Moasia, because I want them to just to talk a little about uh, doing teaching practice during the COVID-19. Any of you, Juliet or Dr. Garuya, Dr. Juliet or Dr. Garuya, just give us some hints on how did we do teaching practice during COVID-19? Sorry, I'm abushing you. Dr. Garuya? Is Dr. Garuya still? Yes, Bonface, you are with us.
Yes, uh, Juliet and Boniface and Ruben are all able to talk. So yeah, if any of you would like to intervene. Boniface, are you able to talk? Uh, Ruben, uh, are you able to talk? Yes. Yeah, Ruben, I'm here. So, sorry, I, I, I may have missed uh, the question or the comment I was supposed to talk about. Uh, actually, we wanted you to comment on uh, the lecturer's ability to embrace technology uh, within the period of COVID and how we are doing right now in terms of technology from a lecturer's point of view. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Of course, um, the, the University of Nairobi, from the time when COVID came, of course, initially there were quite a number of challenges because um, uh, a number of lecturers and not yet embraced the use of uh, ICT, but uh, there were massive and uh, numerous uh, trainings uh, on the use of uh, ICT, um, and um, all the lecturers actually embraced that. And uh, we have been uh, teaching uh, online, of course, even setting of examinations online, online, even marking of examinations online. So I, I would say that uh, there has been massive support, which has facilitated the, the embracing of ICT uh, in teaching the, in the University of Nairobi. Of course, there are a few challenges here and there in terms of a network sometimes. A few other challenges, um, electricity, connectivity, especially for our students. So, so those are some of the challenges that we are facing. But in terms of capacity building, I, I would say that um, almost all lecturers have embraced ICT in teaching. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Motegi, uh, for that. Uh, if uh, we don't have anybody else who'd want to talk, Esther, uh, Dr. Garuya, uh, Dr. Moasia, um, I think we are doing very well in terms of time. Uh, there is someone who have asked a question on challenges seem to outweigh the benefits of online learning. Students are less and uninterested in class, in, in class, internet connection problem, academic dishonesty, um, what is the way uh, forward and, or what is the way to go about it? I think uh, I may not uh, be able to answer that question very well, but I, I, I think as uh, our first chancellor said uh, that uh, um, the university is moving and not uh, forgetting that we have some challenges. And I think we, we will be solving those challenges as we continue uh, because uh, this is something that uh, has hit everyone, has hit the, the Minister of Education, has hit the Minister of Higher Education, sorry, the higher education sector. And therefore, uh, some of the challenges that we are having, uh, we will need to be solving them one by one. And of course, uh, knowing that uh, we may not go back to where we were, we may want to embrace the, the what uh, people call the new normal. And of course, uh, borrowing uh, good lessons and uh, applying those good lessons in our day-to-day -day activities. If there's anybody with a better answer, maybe Dean, you can help me uh, from your perspective. What are some of, the, um, uh, some of the solutions that we can have maybe to uh, bring some of the challenges that we are facing uh, simpler? I'm happy to um, be able to share some ideas, um, but I think Esther has her hand raised. Is it okay if Esther goes first? Yes, can I talk please? Can I yes, hear Esther. Something? Sorry, Esther, you can talk before the Dean summarizes as we close. Okay, I, I, I thought you forgot about me. So I am Esther Mamonkwes, Dr. said. And I'm a high school teacher of English and literature. Before COVID, I was training, I was teaching my students using desktops, ICT integration in the teaching of English. But when COVID hit, I realized now the desktops, the laptops are all, all locked up, the schools are closed. So I became very innovative and I turned to the smartphone because I realized everything that is in the desktop yeah, and this. Um, 
laptop is also in the smart uh, the, the smartphone so i collaborated with my parents parents who, who students i teach and they came up very well they supported me they actually allowed me to teach their students using the smartphone that was 20 2020 march and i would regret it because i would i i, I was able to get my students and I would use very low tech, very low tech or no tech uh, digital tools. You would not believe it because I would use SMS. I would call the students. I even allowed them to call me to consult on the areas that were hard for them. I also carried out some, some training, online training on how the students can use some digital tools to learn. For example, how they capture their assignments they would write their questions and answers on the exercise books. They capture the pictures using the PDF scanners. I trained them on how to install PDF scanners. They would share their assignments. I would use the WhatsApp uh, editor to edit their work, make comments, and they were very excited. This kept them uh, going. With, when, with time, I realized I need to I needed to know more, so I engaged in a lot of online professional development meeting by Google, for example, where I learned that I can do Google Classroom. So I did the Google Classroom, I introduced it to my students, I trained them on how to install, how to join. I even showed that I taught them how to create emails and share with me so that I would invite them in classes. And we went on very well. I would uh, share resources with the students. They would interact with the resources. They would ask me questions and we engaged. Post COVID-19, uh, the entire online teaching and learning became even better because I had more students on board who were interested. Come the end of that year, the national exams and the performance was, uh, was the best, I would say. In the Roiruk sub county, my English class stopped in the sub county. So I would say this is the way to go. The 2021 class also, I took them through the same online classes in collaboration with the parents, and we have had a very good time with them. And this has now challenged the lower classes, such that even the home ones, the home twos have joined the, the group classroom with their numbers. Right now, we have closed school and you cannot believe it. Every morning, I wake up to a lot of assignments to my course. The parents are available in the evening so the students can access their smartphones to chat, to ask questions, to share their work, the assignments or questions. And every morning, I wake up to a lot of assignments to, to, to mark a lot of consultations, a lot of, a lot of challenging questions. And I think I like that we saw. I have, I believe therefore the smartphone is the future for learning and therefore I want to challenge uh, us to, to embrace the smartphone because it's flexible, it, it is cost effective. You will get everything you want real time and it is student centered because the student is using his or her parents' smartphone. It is collaborative also because the parents are on board to follow up, to monitor, to even check on what is going on. And the students, we are dealing with, a, with digital native students, children who have grown up with the smartphone. So training them on, on how to use some of these tools is not hard. And therefore, I feel it is good. Then in, the, in each class, I have what I call subject promoters, two of them. Now, one of them is, is non-digital in that they, they are not able to access the, the smartphones, but they are good in English. The other one is digital, and I don't care whether they are good in English or not, but they are digital so that they can train these others when they go home. And again, they can share the resources when they come back to school so that we can have everybody taken care of. Every resource I share, every assignment I give over the weekend mostly, uh, I ensure that these subject promoters share with the rest of the students that every student gets the resources, the assignments, and they are now able to ask me the difficult to answer questions. So far, I am not complaining and the smartphone for me is the future for education. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Esther, um, for those uh, 
innovative uh, strategies that you have used over time. Uh, and maybe uh, one of these days you'll help us to understand more on the way we can also be part and parcel of the innovation so that we, we can help our learners. And especially because we know that uh, many of us have smartphones, but sometimes we may not even uh, be sure of what, um, what else can we do with our smartphones that can help our learners. Uh, thank you so much, Esther. I will bring uh, now the Dean, and then after the Dean, uh, Helen, your heart is up, so we'll give you a chance as we come closer to finishing. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, yeah. Well, my name is Dean uh, rather than the Dean of a university. I, I think my mom named me that on purpose. <laughs> That's why I work in education, I guess. But just to say, as we wrap up um, today's webinar, which really was insightful, I took a whole bunch of notes, um, but I wanted to go back to your opening comments, uh, Luis. Um, and you said we need to rethink, reimagine, re-innovate, recreate education. And I think today was a great example of how the University of Nairobi has adapted and transformed. Uh, it was inspiring to hear uh, Julius, uh, you know, the vice chancellor of just, you know, how, you know, the organ, you know, the university has made a difference. And they've, as you said, Luis, they went to the students when they couldn't come to the campus. I think that's a great example. And then here at the end to hear these really practical ways that Esther um, has met the needs of her students. I love that she just called them, you know, as simple as that, calling them to help them with their homework and having them take pictures, you know, so many creative solutions. And I think that um, it's just an example of teachers who care about their students and they want to help them learn. And it's just, uh, uh, those are the stories I think that keep us all going. And um, the pandemic is still here, sadly. Um, and we're learning as we go and, so much um, has changed because of this, but then going back to our colleague in Kakuma, talking about how he's looking for the opportunities. And I think that's, that's an important message for all of us. Where can we find those open windows to change, positive change and the opportunities? Um, and he's shared some great examples of that. So thank you for today and for having this uh, time together. Um, I've learned a lot. Thank you, thank you so much, Dean. Uh, we always count on your wisdom. Um, Helen, um, Helen Afisa, you'd want to say something? Yes, uh, Dr. Lois, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, what I wanted to say is that I really commend Nairobi University or University of Nairobi for being our lead university in offering education in emergencies, a subject or a training to our teachers. And there is need actually to train all the teachers on education in emergencies, even as a unit and even in other universities. And as a lead university, you need to do something also about this with the support from Ministry of Education and also Emergencies are there and there is need, need to come up with innovative ways of delivering lessons to learners during emergencies because very many miss out, especially in conflict zone areas and also in areas which are uh, stricken by maybe extreme hunger like now on the issue of drought and also when they, they are, we have floods. And as we know, education cannot wait. Uh, we, it can't wait. It's also an, a basic area for humanitarian response to be prioritized. So what can we do? Or I'm not asking a question, but I'm just posing because we need to do something to come up with innovative ways. We know the State Department for Early Learning and Basic Education it's very big. When you look at the, 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 the ECDs, that is early childhood education centers, primary schools, and even secondary schools all over the country, some in hard to reach areas, somewhere there's no network, 
but uh, mostly with the uh, disaster striking and many children uh, remaining out of uh, learning. We need to come up with something and with the support of our higher institution led by Nairobi University, which is offering education in emergencies, it is very critical. And to the INE minimum standards, I think I was learning about the standard which have come up to add on what we usually have something on some cube, some ice cube in Dubai. I was looking at it also, but the issue of uh, the standards for provision of virtual learning, I think it is not really well captured. We really not need to do something because this is a new uh, thing that has come due to emergencies and we need to do something. So it's just uh, posting this to the panelists who are here to go think about it. We also think about it, but we need to do something so that children are not left out during emergencies. And the only solution to this is actually provision of uh, maybe remote learning or virtual learning but as we know, gadgets are expensive. Some areas network cannot reach there and we really need to be very innovative. So thank you very much for coming up with this uh, discussion. It has really given us some insight to think about how we can ensure that we move to the new shift of provision of virtual learning, especially in times of emergencies where all children can be kept, we know education accords a, a protection to children and also it keeps children busy so that they do not get involved in other activities which mess their lives. The way we saw during COVID-19, many girls became pregnant, many boys uh, fell out of school and they are in border border business and uh, any other uh, businesses which can give them little money. We need to do something to ensure that education continues and also bearing in mind education cannot wait because time is moving and when children are left out, a lot goes wrong. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, from the voice of the Minister of Education, your own voice, uh, you have thrown a big challenge to us as a university. Um, and uh, the university continue um, maybe looking at uh, what is happening uh, in the emerging market and the emerging um, education emergencies ecosystem. And uh, one of the things that we have done as a university, we have answered one of the basic questions that we have been ans asked many times. Uh, because we normally teach uh, master students, uh, we don't have undergraduate, we don't have uh, lower lower levels, and we just launched, um, not really launching, we just approved, uh, the university approved a diploma in teacher education in emergencies, uh, which is going to um, get some of our teachers in the camps and also in the host communities enrolling because uh, we have realized that uh, we may not be solving all the problems that uh, we have using the master's program, but uh, we have now the Diploma in Teacher Education in Emergencies program, which we are going to be launching very, very soon. Uh, we are right now um, preparing the materials, uh, which is going to be an online uh, uh, course. So that is one of the solutions that we are offering. And of course, uh, uh, the window of opportunity is not even helping us to think that we can bring the, the students uh, face to face. So the other thing that uh, you have uh, really mentioned is how do we continue talking to ourselves uh, in terms of meeting the needs of our learners? And you have just made me to think about uh, the, the lower cadre of uh, our early childhood education. When you are talking about uh, um, solutions in 2020. I didn't hear anybody talking about early childhood education, those young children. Suppose the COVID continued, what would happen in terms of early childhood education? We know that it's a foundational, foundational um, space for them, uh, for those young children to go into early childhood. But we saw that uh, during the COVID, we were only thinking about the primary, the, the, the 
the primary, the secondary, and the university. And uh, even when we talk about uh, basic solutions like gadgets, how do we ensure that uh, early childhood education? And especially now thinking about uh, the, the many dynamics we had with the parents, uh, it was the first time that parents were taking responsibility. Would they take responsibility over their young children in terms of curriculum delivery and curriculum uh, implementation? These are some of the questions that you'd want to carry. And uh, as we continue reimagining uh, 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 education beyond COVID, these are some of the questions that you'd want to carry and uh, continue the dialogue because this must be a dialogue. It must be a collaborative dialogue. Uh, you cannot solve um, all the questions or all the, the needs as a university. We must have a collaborative framework with the people with good lessons, people with uh, maybe solutions that we may not have and so on and so forth. And very, very important for us to work with the Minister of Education in terms of finding solutions. Uh, I would just want to mention as I close that uh, we did uh, an analysis with the UNESCO IIP, which was targeting the Ministry of Education in terms of coordination and leadership of COVID-19. And uh, some of the recommendations we made were, were, of course, the document will be coming out soon. Some of the recommendations was needed to strengthen uh, education emergencies within the Ministry of Education. And therefore, uh, I think uh, we are not lost to what we can do and we are not lost to the solutions that we can offer. Uh, thank you so much. And I will return uh, my mic to Natalie uh, because we are coming close to the end of the webinar. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Louise, Dean, Helen, and others um, who uh, made their questions here. Um, it was really great hearing from all of you. Uh, we appreciate your participation um, and you know, we hope you enjoyed this discussion. Um, thanks again and um, just want to close the webinar um, and also mention that the recording of this uh, webinar and all of the rep all of the presentations will be shared by email and posted on our INE website. So uh, do look out for that and we look forward to seeing you again in other INE webinars. Thanks again, Louise, for organizing, Dean, for joining, all the panelists, all of those who, who gave their insights in today's webinar. Thank you. Louise, oh, you're on mute. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll see you another time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.